2014. A brilliant businesswoman from Bulgaria and Germany called Dr. Ruz Rignatova promised the world that she'd created the next Bitcoin. You may have missed out on Bitcoin, she told people, but I have created a better version of Bitcoin. It's faster, it's smoother, it's simpler, it's easier. It's designed for the masses and it's called OneCoin. Any OneCoin investors in the room? No. Very quickly, this OneCoin started to grow. People started talking about it to each other. Friends would tell each other about this revolutionary cryptocurrency from Bulgaria that they'd heard about. There would be a seminar in Amsterdam. There would be a great workshop in Tokyo. People would gather at friends and family's house to discuss this amazing project. And by the middle of 2016, hundreds of thousands of people from every country on Earth were investing money in OneCoin, believing that they had found their next incredible financial opportunity. There were critics, there's always critics though, critics who said this sounded like a pyramid scheme, like a Ponzi scheme, because it was sold through something called multi-level marketing, where friends would recruit friends who'd recruit friends, each of whom would make a small commission. But Dr. Ruja Ignatova said those people are haters, they don't understand the future of money or the future of finance. By the time she stands up in front of 3,000 screaming and adoring fans at Wembley Arena in the middle of 2016, the price of one coin is going up extremely fast. There are people in the audience who have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of euros worth of one coin. And she calls it the Bitcoin killer. People are selling their homes People are selling their cars, they're leaving their jobs, they're selling their livestock, all so they can invest in one coin. But the critics by early 2017 are starting to get louder. The regulators are starting to sniff around. A technologist who's fascinated by Bitcoin, called Björn Bjorki from Norway, starts investigating their blockchain technology that's supposedly powering this one coin. Ruja said it was unlike Bitcoin, it was centralized so we can control it properly, but I'm not gonna let you see it in case you steal it. He discovers that all is not right with, Bit with one coin's technology. A small exchange site where some investors sometimes were able to turn some of their one coin holdings back into real money suddenly shut down entirely in January. And by October 2017, four billion euros from one million people has been invested into OneCoin. They're talking about what color Bentleys they're gonna buy. They're talking about the homes and holidays they're going to enjoy when they can turn that money back into real fiat, tangible cash. And then on October 2017, Dr. Ruja takes a Ryanair flight, of all things, from Sofia, Bulgaria, to Athens, Greece, and disappears into thin air, and has not been seen since. That is the story of one coin. And for the last three and a half years, I have been trying to find, pretty much since the last time I was here, I've done nothing else but trying to find Dr. Ruja Ignatova. And yesterday, Yesterday, on the way here, the FBI put Dr. Ruja Ignatova on their top 10 most wanted fugitive list, at last. So my phone's been going off all day, but I've said, guys, I'm somewhere, I've far more important things to do today than worry about this. It all started as a podcast project, and that's why we've got the amazing Bulgarian choir here. I wanted to demonstrate to you the importance of music in audio content. The podcast we made, the Missing Crypto Queen BBC podcast, we had a real concern. And the worry was, Bulgarians might be getting fed up with hearing stories from other countries talking about scam artists. And we didn't want to just portray that story. Dr. Ruja was Bulgarian, but she was also a German national. 
Most of what she did was actually in London and Frankfurt and around the world. But we wanted to show the other side of Bulgaria and its amazing culture as well. So we commissioned a Bulgarian choir to do all of the music for us. Svetla, can you just say a few words, please? This is why we wanted to bring the Bulgarian music, the folk music, to you and give you a couple of examples as well. Bulgarian folk music. What does it mean for the country? What, what does it mean for a Bulgarian, this Bul style of music? Bulgarian people are really proud of our uh, folk music because it's really special. You really need to know the character from the Bulgarian uh, person because we are really emotional. We are unpredictable. <laughs> yeah? We are really flexible as well. And we are open to people and our music, our way of singing is also open. Mm. And if I want to take with me, I can do that just for a second. Mm. See, exactly, and this <laughs> is what, no, keep the microphone, because this is what we thought. And the, the story of one coin, it is exciting in one sense, because we're in the pursuit of a missing person, but it's incredibly sad and melancholic as well, because it's about, millions of euros stolen and people who've lost everything. And we wanted to be able to show both of those things through the music that we chose. And the range of opportunities and options in Bulgarian folk music seem to offer us that. So I want to give you an example. We haven't practiced this, by the way. We were desperately trying to find Dr. Ruja Ignatova. We're traveling around the world. It's really fast-paced. And one of the things I loved about Bulgarian music was this, I don't even know what you call it, this yipping noise, a yip. Yeah. What's it called? Yeah, we have uh, two uh, ways of ips. It should be, if it's up in the end of the uh, song, we'll, uh, we'll call it shouting. But if you are uh, a little bit uh, upset, we'll call it uh, uh, screaming. Wow. Screaming. And can, I can, you give us, a, can you give us a quick I'll, example? I'll give you a screaming uh, Okay, example. get ready for this, guys. Your soul is broken. You can hear that just in the beginning. That's the soulful stuff. Can I also hear, which is incredible. Did you not feel moved immediately by it? So the whole, the whole thing about the audio content you're trying to make is obviously to create a mood underneath everything. But I also want to hear this yip. I want to hear the, the high pacing, because this is when the story gets fast. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I want to give you, for my remaining time, I, don't, more, I basically have a choir every time I speak now, so this is what I do. No, it's the first time, it's, I love it. Um, just a few lessons from this story that might be useful to you. 
We're in the in-between, that's what we just heard, between one world and the next. And unfortunately, scam artists love the in-between. That's kind of their playing area. They're always looking for that. And there's a couple of reasons why Dr. Ruja Ignatova and OneCoin were perfect for this in-between world. The first is that there's a crisis of authority is created. People, when she turned up in 2014, and people are pouring all of their money in in 2015 and 16, the regulators, the police, they have no idea what on earth this is meant to be. None of it's really regulated. There aren't really any rules about it. And as a result, none of the regulators around the world that sort of control how banks work and other types of investments work, they had nothing to say which meant that the scammers promoting this would say to everybody, do you really think we could stand up at Wembley Arena in front of 3,000 screaming fans if the police thought that we were a scam company? Of course they wouldn't. And that inaction as a result of a lack of certainty because something so new was used by those people. There was also no real authority. Nobody who invested in OneCoin actually understood the technology. This was aimed at ordinary retail investors, people who'd heard about, maybe heard about Bitcoin and wanted a piece of the action. But as a result, those people didn't know who to turn to to ask for advice. Because I don't know if you ever spend much time in the crypto world, but everyone's calling everyone a scam all of the time. And so if one, if one coin is also a scam, what's the difference? She was brilliant at using what's called affinity fraud to create the impression of authority. She would pay for paid advertisements in respected magazines, which she would then post online to show how legitimate she was, which she would then use to get another speaking gig somewhere else, which she then used to get a third one, all of which would be built into her promotional material. She spoke at an event hosted by The Economist magazine. And a lot of investors said, I've no idea how any of this technology works, but surely someone's checking this, right? The Economist magazine must have checked this. Well, no one's checking when the technology is extremely new. So she played on this crisis of authority, this in-between space. And she was absolutely brilliant at doing it. But the good news is, that it was ordinary people that brought this down. It wasn't mainstream journalists like me. By the time we were making the podcast, 20 to 30 citizen investigators on a scrappy web forum were documenting every single part of this scam. We were all ignoring it, but they were trying to document it. And when the regulators and the authorities finally caught up with this, it was to that website that they were getting all of the information. In the crisis of authority in the in-between space, it is often in these strange corners where you'll actually find the truth, and you've got to dig it out. It won't always be from the mainstream press. Now, I want to give you two lessons, two lessons from this that you could take away. The first one is that overall, the single thing that drove so many people into investing in this currency was one emotion and it was the fear of missing out. People were terrified that they had missed Bitcoin, that they could see their friends down the road. David, my friend from school, who's a complete moron, he bought $50 worth of Bitcoin five years ago, and now he's a millionaire. And frankly, I'm willing to take the chance. They were absolutely terrified of this. The fear of missing out, and when you feel it, I feel it when I go on Instagram every day, but the fear of missing out is a thing that drives the most irrational decisions you can imagine. And the second, I've heard about some amazing technologies today, but let me offer you a word of advice. Every single one of those technologies, some scam artist is somewhere trying to work out how to take advantage of that and twist it in a bad way, use it in a negative way. You know that already. But you've got to double, triple, quadruple your efforts to stop that. And let me tell you why. Because mainstream journalists like me love writing negative stories about technology. Because we're really quite upset about how you're taking everything over and you're stealing all the advertising dollars from us. So 
I believe that a lot of the big press outlets will be very happy to write as many negative stories as they can about every single one of these new technologies. And people will try and misuse it. And you've got to be ready for that, because otherwise we'll lose the potential that it all has. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're wondering, oh, yeah, 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 shut up. Where is this woman that's on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list? I'm going to tell you where I think she is. The big reveal. Can I have just a couple more minutes of music, and I'm going to give you the final line on it? OK, this is what I think happened. If anyone's listened to the podcast, this is the big reveal. All right. OK. So, are you ready for this? You're going to be disappointed, actually. It's not really a... It's not really a yeah, she's over there in the third row. Would you stand up? <laughs> I wish. OK. OK, so this is a podcast episode. We need the music. OK. Right. So, Dr. Ruja takes a Ryanair flight. She goes from Sofia to Athens, Greece in October 2017. She is met by two Russian-speaking men who drive her to Thessalonica in Greece. But she's, that's this whole thing is a ruse. She turns around and drives back into Bulgaria because that is where she is most protected. In January 2018, the German authorities raid her office in Sofia and she decides she's got to get out. They're on to me. So she flees to Dubai in a secret mansion that she's bought for 20 million dirhams and she lives there quietly. She then falls out with a shake over a financial deal. Her brother is arrested in Los Angeles and she realizes she's got to go again. So where does she go? She goes on to a very large yacht on the Mediterranean. And that is my theory of where Dr. Ruja is right now, floating around in the Mediterranean on a large yacht, watching and worrying about the FBI notice because she probably thinks her cook or her bag handler or her sailor is going to dob her in. And I hope that they do. Thank you all very much indeed for listening. And thank you to the choir. Thank you. Thank you. So it's like a live episode of the podcast I've been making. Yeah, it was really stressful, let me tell you that. Whew. Thank you so much, yeah. And actually, we recorded it so you can oh, great. use it Thanks. if you want. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Chubrica. Have you, did you ever hear from them before? No, because we had the London Bulgarian choir. Ah. And then when we were talking about this, I said, could you please get a Bulgarian choir? It'd be amazing. And I'm so glad these guys came. Thank it you. It was amazing. Much. Yes, please. Uh, could you also share your name, please? My name is Svetla Anastasova. And nice uh, Svetla be taken Zonach of Sony. Uh, but it's choir. It's, these, these are Dutch people. They're singing Bulgarian folk music. I'm Bulgarian, but the rest of the people are Dutch. We have another two Bulgarian girls, and I'm so happy to have these people here mm. in Amsterdam. It's such an honor to work with such a musical people. Thank you very much. And thank you very much yes. for the opportunity. And one more thing. I was told that you are also looking for new members for the choir. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Singing is really healthy. <laughs> you can take lots of energy. It's not so difficult. You need to have really good ear uh -huh. and really good discipline. It's hmm. a top sport because you have to look and you have to do always my instructions, <laughs> but I will learn you how to do it. Uh -huh. and it's much easier if we'll, we'll begin like that. Can you say, hip? <laughs> yes, like that of, oh. oh. Yes, you can follow the intonation <laughs> of my stem, then yours, really musical. You're clever, otherwise you will be not here. And you're welcome to visit our rehearsals 
We are, uh, uh, yes. You have to Google uh -huh. and you'll find our address. But we are looking for young people, clever people. Right. And it's also very gezellig. Yeah, it's very gezellig. All yeah. right. And singing is going together with dancing and drinking. <laughs> okay. Svetlana, ladies and gentlemen. Chubrica. Dancing and drinking and crypto queens. Uh, yeah. I love your job, That's man. It, yeah. yeah, brilliant. When, at what part, um, what point in time did you know that you were on to something good? Because this also might have been an article for The Guardian or a blog post for Wired. When did you know this is going to be my next big thing? Um, to be honest, the way that it all happened was that a BBC producer was being pitched one coin at a dinner party by a friend of a friend who was saying to her, you've got to get into this coin. Oh. Like, I put in 5,000 euros a year ago, and it's already worth 20,000. And, okay, I can't get it out yet, but apparently <laughs> I'll be able to get it out next month. And the, o the other problem is the woman's gone on the run. But that, we don't, you know, no one knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is either, so it doesn't really matter. And I think very quickly we realized this was the strangest story we'd ever heard. The BBC really wanted to find a story that got ordinary people to understand cryptocurrency. Right. You know, because it can be very technical, it can be really alienating, and the sort of people that are investing now, obviously no one listened to the podcast because that are investing now are not sophisticated institutional investors. It's often ordinary people who are kind of just about hearing about this and don't really get it. So they needed a story that could take us through crypto. Right. And a, a person that's gone on the run was a sort of perfect vehicle to do it. Yeah. Some of them already on the podcast. They have shared the link in the Replay Live. Others, I'm sure they are going to subscribe. Um, also, where can we find more of your work if we want to follow you, Jamie? Uh, on the internet somewhere. The internet, yeah, you say? Yeah. yeah, on the internet somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people are asking, what is his next project? But is there already a next project? Um, we're not stopping until we find this Dr. Ruja Ignatova. Oh, okay. This is the only thing. I've worked only on this for the last three and a half years. Nothing else. And we don't stop until, A, we find her, and B, we find as much money as we can so that we can try and get some of it back to the investors. Because mm. I went to small villages in Uganda where every single person pretty much had put money into one coin. And today, now, they still think they're going to get that money out. They're never going to get it out, but they might be able to get a small bit of it out. And if we can get some of that, we'd have done something. Finding the, uh, the Crypto Queen, the sequel. It's okay. Subscribe to the podcast and follow him online. Twitter.com slash Jamie Bartlett. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, man.